So I want to focus on this morning in this chapter, in Titus chapter 2. Of course, I think it's always important, you know, even though I'm going to be focusing in on one verse, I always think it's important to get everything in context, you know, so you could see even for yourself, as with everything that gets preached here, you know, you need to be able to determine for yourself what's right and what's not right. And the best thing to do with, with verses is to get them in context. Now, obviously, the context here, the, the, the epistle of Paul to Titus was, was written to a, to a young you know, a preacher. And um, Paul was giving him a lot of, a lot of wisdom and a lot of knowledge on, on things that he ought to do. And it's, he's telling him here, you know, this is how the older men need to behave. This is how the younger, or the younger men need to behave. The older women, the younger women. These are all these things you need to look out for. You need to be able to teach these things. At the end of the chapter, he says, you know, these things speak and exhort and rebuke. With all authority, let no man despise thee, saying, look, this is all good stuff. This is all doctrine. This is all the word of God. You need to be able to teach this stuff and, and exhort the people and rebuke them. You know, sometimes we need to be rebuked and told, hey, you're wrong about this. This is what's right. You know, this is what God says. But, the, but I'm getting a little bit off, off topic here because what I want to focus in on here is verse 14. Right before verse 15, or let's look at verse 13 just to get a little bit better context. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. And I'm focusing on that, that verse 14 about Jesus Christ who gave himself for us. And the subject of my sermon this morning is why did Christ give himself for us? Now we obviously have the answers right here, but we're going to go into a lot more detail about what this passage is, is saying to us. Where it says, you know, Jesus Christ gave himself for us and praise the Lord for that. Amen. But what I'm going to be going into this morning is what good is that to you? I mean, you might be saved. Now, first of all, it says that he might redeem us from all iniquity. That's the first th reason why he gave himself for us. And praise God for that. Now, um, let's just think about that word redeem real quick. It's not used too often in our, in our modern vernacular, the modern speech. But it's a real simple word to understand. You know, oftentimes you'll get a, a can or a bottle and it'll have like a redemption value. Right? And I know we don't do that in Arizona and I don't think we did that in Illinois where I grew up. But like they'll have certain states on there where basically what it is, they'll have like a nickel or a dime or whatever. So if you go and return that bottle, they'll give you money for, for bringing that bottle back to them. And that's the redemption value. So it's, it's something that you exchange the bottle and they give you that money. That's, that's the redemption that's being made with that bottle. Now, as you exchange that bottle for money, you don't still keep that bottle. It's gone. It leaves your possession and now it's tra you've got something completely different transferred in its place. And that bottle's for you, it's just gone forever, basically. Now, the Bible says here, Christ came and gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity. And think about that phrase, from all iniquity. Right. All iniquity. Every sin you've ever done, ever will do, all iniquity completely, Christ came to redeem you from that. So what he does is he's taken your sin and exchanged it with his righteousness. That's what Christ has come to do and give himself for, is that he takes every single one of your sins, 100%, nails them to that cross. It's paid for, and he says, you know, all the righteousness that Jesus Christ did, that's been imputed now unto you. He exchanged his righteous life for our sinful life when he died on that cross. Our sins have been buried with him. 1 Timothy chapter 2, you can flip back a few pages if you'd like. 1 Timothy chapter 2, just a few pages to the left. Verse number 5 says, For there is one God. Chapter 2, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Now again, think about that word ransom. What, what normally comes to mind when you think of a ransom? I know for me, I, just, I think of like a kidnapping, right? That's the most common usage that we, we, we would think of as Okay, somebody's kidnapped. As if someone were to kidnap my daughter and then, and then they were to, to contact me and say, okay, you know, you, you need to pay me a million dollars in order to get your daughter back. That would be the ransom money, right? That's what, that's what I would have to pay them in order for, to get my daughter back. Well, Jesus Christ gave himself a ransom for all because if you think about it, our sin has caused a big debt that we owe. And that sin he has paid for 
by giving himself up. And that, that ransom basically goes to God. God's saying, okay, you've sinned. You deserve this punishment of hell. Now you've you got to pay up. And, and Jesus came and he paid that for us. He paid that ransom money, as it were, to, to God. Now, um, once that ransom is paid, basically you're freed from ever. You know, obviously, I know in, in our, in our you know, if you think of like a kidnapping, there's things go bad and wrong and stuff like that because you're dealing with unjust people to begin with. But God is a just God. So when that ransom is paid, he, he frees the person and they're freed forever, Right? So like in, 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 a, in a proper situation, if I were to pay the ransom money for my daughter, I would get her back according to the deal, the, you know, the negotiated deal, and then she would be with me forever. It's not like I have to continually pay a ransom. Once I get her back, I mean, it's, it's over, it's done with. And once Jesus has paid that ransom for us and we've accepted that ransom money, it's gone. It's, 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 it's paid for forever. Now, I'm bringing this up because it's a critical understanding of salvation that it is eternal. And I'm focusing a little bit on this, on this aspect of why Jesus Christ gave himself for us because there's two things, well, three things really that we got in that verse from Titus chapter 2, verse 14. And we're getting to the other two points in a little bit. But I want to make sure that we cover this, that he might redeem us from all iniquity. Because all iniquity means all iniquity of all time. And understanding the concept of salvation being eternal is critical to even be saved. I don't believe, and, and, and you know, some people might disagree with me on this or, or not like it or whatever, but look, I believe the Bible teaches this and I'm going to prove it from the Bible. I'm going to prove it from the Word of God. If someone doesn't believe that their salvation lasts eternally, I don't believe that person's saved. Amen. And I'm not adding any works to it because I'm not looking at a person's works. I'm, I'm, when, I, when I try to judge whether or not a person's saved, I ask them questions and based on what their answer is, what comes out of their heart, assuming that they're telling the truth because I'm not just going to assume they're lying to me, whatever they say they believe, I'm going to trust that that's what they actually believe. So if someone says they believe that, um, you know, well, I believe salvation is by grace through faith, but you can lose that salvation if you go off and you commit murder or you commit some other sin. Look, that person is trusting in works because they're, they're, they're adding in a certain level of, of obedience to the law in order to, keep, to retain their salvation. And they're not believing that Christ has redeemed us from all iniquity, that he's done it. He's done everything from every single iniquity. Christ has redeemed us from that. He's purchased us. He bought us with a price, with his, with his precious blood. He bought us with that price. We belong unto him. Now, turn if you would to 1 John chapter 5, because I like to try to prove things as clear as possible from the scripture. It's one thing for me just to get up here and say, you know what? If someone says they can lose their salvation, I believe that they're not even saved at all. But without giving you supporting scripture to show you as evidence from the Bible, it doesn't mean that much. It's just my opinion. But let's see what the Bible says about this. Because first of all, and I'll just quote this for, in John um, chapter 3, verse 18. It says, He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So all throughout the Bible, you see, the requirement for salvation is believing. So what we believe is obviously very important. Right? You, you have to believe right in order to be saved. And I don't mean believe right on every single doctrine that's laid out in the Bible. But when we're talking about salvation, 1 John chapter 5, where we're going, lays out what we have to believe. And if we don't believe these things, we're making God a liar. Now, if we're making God a liar, I don't see how, you know, like if you're not believing what he says about salvation, you're making him a liar. And that would mean that you're not saved. If you have a different belief than what he says we need to believe or else we're calling him a liar. Let's see what the Bible says in 1 John chapter 5. We'll start reading in verse number 10. The Bible says, He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. And this is important. You might want to, if you like to highlight things in your Bible, highlight these verses because I love to show this to people out soul winning, especially with, with people who are a little bit harder, like they're kind of stuck on the works or they kind of think they could lose their salvation. Because this boils it down. He says, okay. If you don't believe God, you're making him a liar. And he's saying you're making him a liar because you're not believing the record that God gave of his son. He said, this is what God said about his son. And you have to believe this or else you're not saved. Verse number uh, 11, and this is the record. You just spell it out for us. That God hath given to us eternal life 
and this life is in his son. Now, there's, it's a real simple verse. There's not much to it, except, but there's, I, I could break this verse up into about three different sections that we have to believe. First, it says that God hath given to us. It's given. It's not something earned. It's not something deserved. It's not something that you've worked real hard for and, and you deserve it and it's a debt owed to you. No, it's given. It's grace. It's something that he's given to you completely for free. That God has given to us, but what has he given to us? Eternal life, and I'll get to that in a second, and this life is in his Son, so it has to be only through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So if someone believes in any, let's say someone believes two out of three of any of these things, they're not saved. You have to believe all three of them. Because if someone says, well, I believe that God's given it to me, and I believe it's eternal life, but it's through Muhammad but it's through some other antichrist. They're not saved. It needs to be through Jesus Christ. Like That is the only way you can receive that free gift. It has to be through Christ. Or if someone says, you know what, I believe that um, it's grace that God's given it to me, and I believe it's through Jesus Christ, but I don't believe it's eternal. Because he says it's eternal life. Now, that word eternal, it's not very complicated. It just means forever. It means forever and ever and ever. Now, if something is not going to last you forever, how can God use that word and say that it does last forever? It, 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 I use this example all the time. I'll say, you know, I give a, a real extreme example. I'll say, here's somebody, you know, that's 20 years old. They believe on Jesus Christ today. Ten years later, you know, they go out and they commit all these different sins and they kill somebody and they kill themselves and all this other stuff. And, I, and this is why I usually like to ask people to get to the heart of what they believe, just to see, you know, because it's one thing to repeat things that you've heard in church. It's another thing to actually believe it in your heart. And, you know, sometimes, I mean, people are very honest people in general, and they don't even realize that they actually believe something a little bit different than what might, they might even repeat out of their mouth. And this, but, but a question like that gets to the heart of, of, of what a person believes. Because if you could, if you could give an example of someone who got saved when they were younger, but then did a lot of bad things later on, it's like, well, if you don't believe it's because of their works, then you don't believe it's because of their works, no matter what they do. Right. And if you believe that they have eternal life, then you believe that that life never ends. And I'll tell you this, if God sends somebody who believes on him to hell, they did not have eternal life. Right. Hell is the second death. Hell is death. That is not life. They exist, yes. They're tortured and tormented forever, yes. But that is not life. Eternal life is, is life. It's life in heaven. It's life with God forever. It's, it's, it's life. It's the opposite of death. So in order to have eternal life, it has to last forever. For, for me to have, you know, my favorite verse in the Bible is John 5, 24. Jesus Christ said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation but is passed from death unto life he says you have everlasting life so again you know people might try to say oh well you get eternal life like later after you die no 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 the very moment you put your faith and believe with all of your heart in the lord jesus christ you have eternal life that's when your eternal life starts and if it's eternal it never ends it never ends and if there's something that you can do where god's going to send you to hell then it was only temporary life. He cannot make these claims and say it is eternal life. And you must believe that it's eternal life or else you're not saved. He says, or else, or else you're calling God a liar. Is God a liar? Of course not, right? So we need to believe that, that it's a gift, it's given to us, it's eternal, and this life is in his son. It's very powerful. I mean, this spells it out and lays out real, real easily there and saying, okay, well, if you believe you can lose your salvation, you're calling God a liar. Your belief isn't right. You have to believe and accept the finished work of Jesus. The complete payment. It's not a partial payment and then we got to make up the rest. He paid the whole way. Praise God for it. And that is the, the primary reason why Jesus came. He came that he might redeem us from all iniquity. But that's not the only reason. And this is why I want to get into the meat of this sermon this morning. You know, I cannot overlook or underemphasize the fact that Jesus Christ came to pay for all of our sins and that we need to be saved. But I'm preaching to a group of people who already are saved. Amen. 
And why did Jesus Christ give himself? I mean, think about it. He gave himself for you, and you could praise God for your salvation, but what are you doing with it? Because he came not only to save your soul, but to do even more for you. Right. And we need to make sure that we recognize this so that we can try to be patterned and fit into the mold that he has in store and in mind for us. You don't have to turn back, though. You could if you want, but actually turn to... Um, oh, you're in, you're in First John. Just stay where, you're, stay where you're at. There's one more point I wanted to make about, about this. I, I forgot I had this in here. But this is a very, very good point. People have a hard time, I think, grasping the new creature that we have inside of us. You're in 1 John chapter 5. Jump down to verse number 18. We just read, you know, verses 10 and 11. Look at verse number 18. The Bible says, We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one toucheth him not. Now, if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you're born again. You're born of God. You have a new creature inside of you, but here it says you don't sin. And this, this is just goes to help further understand eternal life. That's why I have this in here, because I want you to understand that concept and know that eternal life truly is forever, that even though you do, because we do consider, look, I don't know anybody who's perfect and doesn't sin these days, but you say, well, wait a minute then. How can that be? How can the Bible say that whosoever is born of God doesn't sin? Yet, we all still sin. Does that mean I'm not born of God? No. And flip back, if you would, to um, Romans chapter 7. I'm going to read another, another verse in 1 John chapter 3. says, uh, Verse 9 says, Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. But this is important. It says, For his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. What you need to understand is that when you're unsaved, an unsaved man, you have a dead spirit. When the word of God is preached unto you, you hear God's word. The Bible says that that's a seed being sown in your heart. The seed doesn't always produce life because it requires you to believe. Once you believe, that seed becomes new life inside of you. You have a new spirit that is born again inside of you. That spirit is born, and that spirit is the new creature or the new man that resides inside of you. In that aspect of you. Now, you have a new addition to your life. You still have the same person you were before. You still have this flesh. All of the lusts and desires that you had before, they don't just go away. It's not just like a light switch and it turns on and all of a sudden everything bad that I used to like to do, I just don't ever want to do any of those things ever again and I'm only doing good from here on out and I just don't sin anymore. It's not the way it works. But we have a new creature and that new life inside of us now is what causes us to have that inner struggle. We have that battle, the flesh and the spirit warring against each other and at odds with each other until the day we die and until we get a new body that, that is perfect without sin. But um, look, if you would, at Romans chapter 7. Romans 7 does a really good job of, of explaining this concept of having a new man and the old man. Look at verse number 14 of Romans chapter 7. That's where we're going to start reading. Romans 7, verse 14. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. Now, it's kind of almost like a tongue twister there, but what he's saying is, you know, the things that I don't really want to do, I end up doing those things. You know, the sins that, that like, I don't want to commit, all, I, like, for some reason I end up doing those things. And then the things that I want to do, you know, the things that are good, the things I do want to do, I, I don't end up doing those things. And that's, that's what he's saying here in verse number 15. He explains, he goes further on, he says in verse 16, if, if then I do that which I would, would not, would just means he doesn't want to, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. 
For I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, he, he clarifies this, in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Saying, look, when I do wrong, it's because of this sinful flesh that I have that's driving me to do this wrong thing. Even though in my spirit I want to do what's right, the sinful flesh is driving me that way. And he's saying, it's not really me that's doing those things. It's not the new man. It's not the new creature doing those things. It's the flesh that's driven you to do those things. He says in verse 23, or verse 22, um, where did we finish? 21, I think. I think we finished in verse 20. Verse 21, I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me, for I delight in the law of God after the inward man. After you see the inward man, he loves the law of God. He, want, you know, he loves God's word. He loves God, you know, all the commandments and they're good. Even though he doesn't always follow all of those things, the inward man does and the inward man loves those things. Verse 23, but I see another law in my members. Members, he's referring to his flesh, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. This is how that which is born of God doesn't commit sin because that new creature doesn't sin. The new creature that, that is born of God, that from the seed of God that is, that is sprung up in your, in your heart and in your life, that always does good. And that's why when we shed this flesh, if you're saved, you have that spirit, Hey, that spirit hasn't sinned. It's the flesh that's caused you to sin. The flesh is gone. And when the flesh is gone, now you can, you can go to heaven because you don't have that sin. That sinful the body is gone and your spirit is alive in Christ. And it's born of, of God and his righteousness has been imputed unto that new man where, where you are going into heaven. This old sinful flesh is never going to see heaven. Right. But it is going to be changed and transformed into a new, a completely new, completely different body that's, that, that is without sin. So hopefully that helps you understand that a little bit because I know sometimes the first, those passages in 1 John can be a little bit difficult to understand when you're like, wait a minute, what do you mean we can't sin? But it's just having that proper understanding of, of the duality where we have a, a spirit and we have the flesh. And they're two different aspects of our person. And Christ has come and he's given himself to redeem us from that sin. And now he's saying, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord that, you know, that, that he is given us that spirit basically and he's um he will deliver us from the body of this death we're not stuck in this body forever we will be delivered from this body but the second part and i was getting a little bit ahead of myself in uh in titus chapter 2 verse 14 the text verse for the sermon who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people so another reason why Jesus Christ gave himself, gave his own life for us. It's not just to save our souls, but also to purify in himself a peculiar people. Now that word peculiar, think about that. Peculiar means strange, right? It means a little bit different. Like, oh, that's kind of peculiar. That's not normal. That's not ordinary. That's peculiar. That's different. Uh, 1 Peter 2, verse 9 says, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Now, <coughs> peculiar means strange, but strange according to who? Right? Well, it's strange according to the world. What, what just, in general, everybody would, would deem to be strange or unusual that's what, what the, the, the saved person is going to be peculiar to. And we ought to be peculiar. Galatians chapter 1 says, um, just stay, or you're, you're in Romans 7. Turn, if you would, to 1 John chapter 2. 
Galatians 1, 4 says, Who gave himself for us, again, taught for our sins, talking about Jesus, that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father. This world is evil. Sometimes we do things and say things that sounds strange to the world. And as Christians, we ought to. And this is, and this is kind of the point, is that you know, we are supposed to be a different people. We are supposed to be peculiar. If you're a Christian and you fit right in with the world and nobody has any reason to say that you're a little bit different because of the, the things of the Bible, you know, let's say you listen to all the same music, you watch all the same TV programs, you read all the same books, you have all the same entertainment, you use the same language, you have the same lifestyle, everything about you is that you fit exactly right in with the world, then there's something not right with you. Right. You're missing a major reason why Christ gave himself for you. He gave himself for you to purify you, to be a peculiar person. You're supposed to be a little bit different. God created a new spirit within you. You still have this sinful flesh that likes all the things of the world, but God wants that new creation to show itself and have dominion over the flesh. That new spirit should be dominating your life, not the flesh. Now, it can be a struggle, and I get that. That's why you need to feed the Spirit. When you feed the flesh, your flesh is going to get stronger and stronger and stronger. When you feed the Spirit, your spirit will get stronger and stronger and stronger. You need to, you need to starve the flesh and feed the Spirit. Most Christians, though, are starving the Spirit and feeding the flesh. And what, what do I mean by that? I don't want to be just real abstract and vague, right? Because that's not going to do you any good. If you're indulging in whatever appetite your flesh may have, and there's lots of things, and we're going to see in 1 John chapter 2 um, uh, some examples of this further, but let's just say alcohol is a good example, right? That's, that is a desire of the flesh. And I know about this firsthand. Look, I used to, to really, really be into drinking. I love drinking. That was something that, that I did for years and years and years and years and years and years. The flesh wanted to do that. The flesh felt good, getting that goofy, drunk feeling and, and whatever and all the other stupid things that go along with it. And yes, it's stupid, it's ignorant, and, and, and you, know, you realize that oftentimes later. But to the flesh, it feels good. Doing drugs to the flesh feels good. It's something that, hey, my body's tingly and this is kind of cool and this is, you know, whatever. That's something that when you're living in the flesh, hey, if you're saved and you're doing that, you are completely quenching your spirit because you're just feeding your flesh and that flesh is going to dominate you and it brings you into the bondage of sin. And sin, all sin will bring you into bondage. It might start off like it's, oh, it's just a little bit fun and before you know it, you're becoming a slave to that bottle. You're becoming a slave to those cigarettes. You're becoming a slave to those drugs. You're becoming a slave to the pornography. You're becoming a slave to whatever it is that your flesh is, is trying to be gratified with. We need to starve the flesh, but in order to starve that flesh, we need strength. Our spirit needs to be strengthened. The things of God are going to strengthen our spirit. So what you need to do, and, and look, when your flesh is real strong and your spirit's weak, even picking up your Bible and reading is going to be a very big chore for you. Now, hopefully it's not, but I'm just trying to be honest here. When you're, when you're used to a life of this, this, this flesh gratification and you're just watching all the TV and the wicked Hollywood movies that are just being pumped, you're, all this other excitement and things that are going on that, that your flesh just finds so amusing and so great, sitting down and just reading a book for a little while and getting away and, and reading God's Word, it's not going to be that fun. But it's what your spirit needs. It's what that new man needs. You need this knowledge. You need this wisdom in your mind to help you to grow. You need to be praying to God and asking God and begging God to help you and strengthen you and edify you. You need to be coming to church. You need to be hearing the preaching of God. You need, you need to be going out and, and trying to help other people. You say, yeah, but I'm so weak in the spirit. I'll tell you what. When you go out and you can show yourself to God that you want to be used by him, He'll help you out that much the more. Guaranteed. He says, oh, here's someone who, who I can use. Here's someone who's saying, here am I, Lord, send me. Yeah, he's got a lot of sins. Yeah, he's got a lot of problems. But God loves that to use that person to, to bring more glory unto his name. It's the weak and, and, the, and the, the ones that are not powerful that God gets more glory and honor for than the ones who have all these talents and all these abilities. Hey, 
whatever state you're in, try to start moving the right direction. God will start meeting you halfway. He'll start, you, you take a step towards God, he's going to start taking a step towards you. But you need to be putting that, that effort forth. In all of these aspects, that's how we're going to strengthen our spirit. That's how we're going to try to get dominion over our flesh so that when the flesh tries to, tries to rear its ugly head and, and try to steer you into sin, you can be like, no, I'm not doing that. For one, God's word is saying, that's a trap. That's a snare. I'm not going to get involved in that. You can't trick me with that. I'm not going to allow that the illusion of this fun and, and, and partying. You know, like, no, I know the end of that. Man. The end of that whore is the way, you know, is, is, the, is the way down to hell. So, you know, Proverbs gives lots of wisdom. Read Proverbs. It talks about alcohol. It talks about the, the whore, you know, the, 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 the woman that tries to flatter you and, and, to, and to get you to, to commit fornication and adultery. Hey, the ends of those ways are death. That's not good. With God's wisdom and his, you know, strengthening your spirit, we could, we could resist those temptations and resist that, that death. So what happens is when you start walking in the Spirit more and doing the things that God has set out before you and you're avoiding all these snares and all these traps, you're going to start looking peculiar to people. Real basic examples. And this isn't just to say, you know, I'm going to use myself as an example. And it's not to lift myself and say, oh, look at how holy I am. And, and you know, the point isn't to be different just for be the sake of being different. Right? So when people say, oh, the, you know, that's kind of peculiar, that's kind of strange about you, it's not like we're just trying to figure out, hey, what can I do to just be different from everybody else? There's always reasoning behind it. And I haven't preached really a, a full sermon on this in quite a while, but for example, the, the, the Hollywood movies and the programming on the television that comes in, most people these days are completely desensitized to it and it, they don't see a problem. They say, why in the world would you not watch a movie? Like, why can't we just go out and, and watch and enjoy a movie? I mean, go see an action flick or go see a drama or whatever. I don't understand. What's the problem with that? Well, here's why I don't ever watch that stuff. Because what Hollywood, Hollywood, first of all, is wicked. It's run by a bunch of God-hating people. I mean, whether it's the Jews or whether it's the, you know, um, the, the Sodomites or both or what, you know, whatever, whatever they are producing these movies, they have an agenda. Yeah. And when you can separate yourself and you're not in the middle of everything, you can start to see the agenda that's been planned and that's being promoted through their films. And what it is, is you start to notice a lot more. And, I, and I'll, I'll challenge you, if you haven't done this, if you still watch all these movies and TV shows, don't watch them for a month. And first of all, just see if you can do that. See if you're not just so, your flesh is just so addicted. And I just need to watch this stuff. Because that's how an addiction works. I mean, if you can't separate yourself from that, then you have a problem. Yeah. And I don't care if that's alcohol, drugs, or even a video game. If you can't say, you know what, I'm not going to do this, and, and, and it's, it's okay, you've got a problem with that. You're in bondage to that, and it could be anything. And you need to be able to get that in check. And if it happens to be TV and movies for you, you'll find out. Just say, say hey, try to do it. I challenge you. And you say, yeah, but it's Christmas time. I want, look, just stop. Who cares? You've, you've seen all that stuff anyways probably a hundred times. It doesn't matter. Put it away and then start to look at it for, with a biblical... And, it's, and here's the other thing you have to do. Replace the TV time with Bible reading. Completely replace it. Say, whatever hours I was going to sit down and watch this TV, now I'm going to read the Bible. And then start to think back of all the stuff that you were watching. And you ought to be able to see the fornication, the adultery... The sodomy promotion now and in, in, in the modern TV shows and stuff, all, everything, there's an agenda to try to get you, first of all, desensitized to sin. Because the more you see something, the less of an impact it has on you. You say, yo, w w the first time they come out with somebody, like some homos on, t on, on the movie screen or on TV, like kissing or something, everybody freaks out because, man, that's disgusting. That's weird. What are you doing? Why did they even have to put this on the show? They do it one time. And then for a whole year goes by, they do it that one time. Then they introduce it again. You're like, oh, man, I don't know why they have to do this. They did this before. And, it was, and then they do it again. It's like, man, that's just kind of disgusting. I wish they wouldn't do that. And then they do it again. And again, 
and again. And now it's just, it's just normal. It's been normalized. And it's not just the sodomy, it's, it's everything. It's, like I said, the, the sleeping around, the foreign, I mean, we live in a world that is extremely promiscuous. I mean, people, these uh, kids these days, you know, it used to be not even that long ago in this country where people would look down on someone who would be called a whore, a, a loose woman, right? That you would not want to even speak to someone like that. Oh, yeah, stay away from that girl. You know, she's got a reputation. Nowadays, it's like, it's exalted. Like, these kids want to have a reputation. Like, oh, you haven't done that yet? And it's completely reversed and flip-flopped and everything's on its end. And a lot of that comes from these, you know, you're watching your hero on the TV screen. Oh, they fall in love and then they go back to their place and then they wake up together. It's like, what happened? They don't even have to show the graphicness of it to know what happened and to get into your mind and start thinking that this is normal. This is Okay. People going out, they've got alcohol as part of their situation. They're, go, you know, they're, they're doing all these different things. And you're watching this stuff over and over and over again. And it's getting programmed. That's why I call it television programming. Because it's getting programmed into your head that this is okay. This is normal. But when you take a stand and be like, you know what? I'm not going to watch that stuff. I don't want that influence in my life. I will set no wicked thing before my eyes, as the Bible says. Amen. I'm not going to do it. Now, all of a sudden, you're starting to look a little bit peculiar to people. As you go to work or as you're around, you know, just the world in general, and someone says, hey, did you see that new TV show? They're like, no, I don't really watch TV. What? You, you don't watch TV? You know, that's kind of odd. It's kind of strange. And that's just one example. There's so many things in our life that we can do. It, when, and, and again, the reasoning behind it is biblical. It's scriptural. It's, it's saying, I don't want to be influenced by this sin and, and, and to have that normalized to me and to have me just have this soft spot for all these different sins. We're supposed to hate sin. We're supposed to hate wickedness. We're supposed to, 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 to be able, you know, because when you do, it's going to be a lot less likely for you to get involved in that. When you have a proper just hatred, to be like, man, I hate adultery. I mean, it ruins lives. People's get, families get split up and these kids are brought up. It's terrible. I don't want to watch something where you start to see and get sensitive. Oh, well, you know, he has all these problems going on at home and his wife's not listening to him very well. And you start to be sympathetic towards this guy's cause. And, oh, yeah, it was a mistake, but, you know. And you start getting a real soft spot for adultery, which the Bible prescribes as having the death penalty on right. because it is so wicked. We need to retain that level of hatred be like, you know, you deserve to be put to death for committing adultery. I'm never going to even get close to that because it's so bad. It, it's so destructive. It's so sinful. And I hate that sin. And I do. I hate that sin. Amen. It's, uh, I mean, the betrayal, everything involved with it is just, it's so bad. But when you allow this, this influence into your life, you start to get sympathetic towards it. And as soon as you let your guard down and be like, oh, okay, well, I kind of understand why I did it and all this other stuff, look, you're not going to have that same strong stand against it. And, and, and pretty soon, before you know it, you might find yourself in a similar situation. Oh, I'm having these problems with my wife now, and it's playing out the way that it did on the TV screen. I'm not going to allow it to happen. I'm not going to allow myself to get desensitized. A peculiar people. Look what the Bible says in 1 John chapter 2 where I had you turn. 1 John chapter 2, verse number 15. The Bible says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world... And this is where it's going to define, because he's saying, look, if you love the world, God's love is in you. If you're just going to say, yeah, I love everything the world puts out. Everything that the world is doing, I just love it. I think it's great. You know, this, this, this humanism, whatever. Everything that the world does is great. And he's going to define here in verse 16, all that is in the world, what is that? The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. Things that you want to feast your eyes on. You know, we call it eye candy. Right? Whether that be for men looking at scantily clad women or nude women or, you know, porn pornography or whatever. That's the lust of the eyes. 
Lust of the flesh, we've gone over that quite a bit. There's a lot of things that could be the lust of your flesh that's just driving you. I mean, it could be overeating. It could be all kinds of things. That you're lust of the flesh. And then the pride of life, being a real proud person, not giving glory unto God, having that, that pride. And, oh, man, you know, we're, we're such a proud nation. You know, Amer American pride and all this other stuff. And it's like, we're not, we're not to be proud and lifted up in ourselves. If we're going to lift anybody up, let's lift up the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. It's not of the Father, it's of the world. The Bible says in verse 17, And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. <laughs> Flip over, if you would, to James chapter 4. I should say flip back. Just again, a few pages backwards from 1 John, James chapter 4. You get to it real quick. James chapter 4. Look at verse number 4. Because the Bible says here that if you're a friend of the world, if, if you're like just real friendly and everything, you're okay, you're okay with what the world does. Not a big problem. I could be, still be friends with you. It says you're the enemy of God. James 4, 4. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Now, <laughs> I don't know about you, but I don't want to be labeled God's enemy. I mean, that's pretty, that, that, that's pretty strong language, wouldn't you agree? I mean, this is pretty severe. He's saying, look, if you're a friend of the world, you're God's enemy. You are completely opposed to everything that God is about if you love the world. And what's being taught today? Oh, this tolerance, acceptance, oh, everything's okay, everything's fine. No, it's not okay. And if you have that attitude of just, just everything's fine, you're a friend of the world. Because that's what the world's agenda is. That's the world trying to push. You're an enemy of God. We have a lot of churches today that try to be friendly to the world. And it's disgusting, you know, it's this great apostasy. They offer all kinds of programs and activities and they're all just completely patterned after the world. Everything that anyone in the world would want to do. Like we have this, this I think it's a potter's house that does, the, the, the Club 180, is that the potter's house that does that? Potter's house is extremely, they're wicked as hell. Okay, this is probably the worst church in the area, the Potter's House. They are they they teach that like you know they're they're real they're they're Pentecostal. They believe that you can lose your salvation, and they keep their congregation in fear that like if you backslide, you're going to hell. And they and they completely like just use a total fear base of just like you can't do anything wrong. And they also believe that like. Yeah, I'm not sinning. You know, it's almost like a sinless perfection type of a thing. They'll still say that they're sinners. But like, they're, they're at this level of where they're still attaining salvation because they're, they're good enough, I guess. But if they start to backslide, then they're going to go to hell unless they repent and get back right with God. And they, they keep everyone in fear and, and they, they, they do all kinds of weird things. I'm not going to get into all the weird stories that I've heard about what they do. But they have this Club 180 and the logo, everything about it looks like a nightclub. Right, and it's designed. Is correct? Uh, uh, I'm going to take your nodding. Uh, I'm doing. I'm saying this right because I don't have every single detail fact about it, but I've heard enough about it. They are targeting it towards teenagers, right? And it's like a dance club, and of course, it's called like this club 180 because it's the whole repent thing, meaning that like you know I was doing all this bad stuff, now I'm doing all this good stuff. But they like really are tricking people into thinking that this is like a, a regular, like a worldly. Dance club, and then they like hit them with, with all the, the Christian stuff. And they'll be playing, I probably like the Christian rock and music like that there, I'm guessing is what, is what it is. But it's completely patterned after the world, so much so that you wouldn't even know the difference. That is being a friend of the world. That's saying, hey, look, all of this world stuff, we're just going to incorporate that to church. Look, they're the enemy of God. Anytime, you know, churches now, they try to change their music because they say, oh, you know, we need to get more people in our church, so let's change our music to be, to be more like the world. And you, look at, you listen to the, to the contemporary Christian music. I, I flip through the, cha the, the radio stations from time to time. I like listening to some talk radio. Just, you know, usually I listen to the Bible, but sometimes I just want to listen to something else. And I'll be flipping through, and it's like, 
I'm on the, the, the low end of the band, you know, in the 80s and in the low 90s to get, because like everything else is just total rock and, and hip hop and all the other stuff that's out there. So I'm in that real small range where you get the classical music and then like so, <laughs> some, some talk radio. And when I hit the Christian stations, it's like, it sounds exactly like what's on these other stations, except they throw Jesus in there except they throw God in there, but the music style, everything is indistinguishable from any other pop song that you would hear that's put out by the world. That's being a friend of the world, my friend. Yeah. That's why in this church we sing the old hymns because you know what? You cannot confuse the songs that we sing with anything other than church music. It is, it's distinct, it's separate, it's completely different from the world. There are no pop stars that are singing hymns. Right. I mean, the, the occasional Christmas song, okay, yeah, I know, you've got, you've got the, the country singers or whatever that, that will do the rendition, or Elvis does, puts out his Christmas album, but that's not their original music, and that's not, you know, you know, even when you hear that, they try to modernize it, but you still know that that's like, that's different, that's separate, that's not what they're putting out. <laughs> this church is never going to change to be more like the world, because I don't want to be God's enemy. Now, the last point I want to bring up here in the text verse, he said, who gave himself for us. Remember, Jesus Christ gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity. We covered that very extensively. And purify unto himself a peculiar people. We need to be different. We ought not to be like the world. And then he says, zealous of good works. So he gave himself for us for three reasons according to this verse. To save us, to make us a peculiar people, and that we would be zealous of good works. Having a zeal. Turn, if you would, to John chapter 2. John chapter 2, we're going to see a good example of somebody that had zeal, that had a great zeal. I'm going to read for you from 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse number 15. The Bible reads, I beseech you, brethren, ye know the house of Stephanus, that it is the first fruits of Achaia, and that they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. It's something that's become, you know, ministering unto the saints, doing good unto the, unto the believers, unto other people people, whatever they could to help out. He says they've addicted themselves unto that. They love it so, I mean, it's just such a part of who they are. They, they're just completely addicted. To it. Man, I'm going to help out, help out. I'm going to do all these good works for them. They're zealous of good works. This is one of the reasons why Christ gave himself for us so that we can have that zeal of helping other people. John chapter 2, Jesus Christ himself. Perfect example of someone who had zeal. Verse number 14, it says, And found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changers of money sitting. And when he had made a scourge, a scourge is a whip of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers' money and overthrew the tables. And he said unto them that sold doves, Take these things, hence make not my father's house and house of merchandise. And his disciples remembered that it was written, The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. So he's talking about the zeal that Jesus Christ had. The scripture foretold of it. When Jesus Christ came into the temple, he sees they set up shop. Now, mind you, they're selling things that had to do with church. They're selling doves. They're selling, you know, the things that would be used for sacrifices. And also, remember this, it was completely legitimate for a person, if you had to travel from far and you wanted to give your offerings unto God, to bring money with you in order to purchase those sacrifices once you got in to the, you know, by the temple in order to do your sacrifices. You say, if it's too difficult for you to bring them back, you know, to bring them all the way with you, it's fine. And it's completely legitimate. But the problem that they had here is they were doing it in the house of God. When the Bible says that, you know, he said, make not my father's house and house of merchandise. When you come into the temple, when you come into church in the New Testament here, it's not for self to be bought and sold. And notice it's bought and sold. It says he drove them out. He says uh, in verse 14, found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changers of money, money sitting. Oh, this, this verse, doesn't, this chapter doesn't reference it, but in the other, in the other uh, Gospels, it references those that bought 
and sold. Here it just says, and when he made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers' money and overthrew the tables. He got upset. He made a big scene about it, too. He wasn't just this soft smoke. I mean, he took the table. He's just like, you know, imagine we just had this whole table set up over here with money, and we've got the DVDs out, and we've got Bibles out, and so we're like, so what do you want? Here, oh, yeah, that's five bucks. Oh, yeah, here's 10 bucks. He takes it, throws it over, money going all over the place. He got his whip, and he's driving the people out, and he's driving the animals out. He's like, get all this stuff out of here. It doesn't belong here. This is the house of God. And besides, the Bible says, you know, buy the truth and sell it not. And that's why we, you know, all the, all the stuff that we have here, it's, it's packed with the truth. You know, we have a message that we're trying to get out. The Bibles, the sermons, the DVDs, whatever it is, hey, we'll buy it all day. We'll, we'll try to get the resources in here. We're not going to sell it. We're going to distribute it. We're going to get it out there because that's the whole point. We're not here trying to make a profit. And look, any, any, you know, resources that we need, it's going to be done in a biblical way, in a scriptural way, where people can bring their offerings and, 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 and give it here to the house of God. But we're not selling things. We're not making God's house a house of merchandise. But we see here the zeal that Jesus had, where he says, I'm not going to put up with this. He has that zeal, because a zeal is more than just what you want or what you wish, right? So like, like everyone here to this morning would probably say like, well, I always want to do good things and I want to help people. I want to do what's right, you know. But when push comes to shove and when you're confronted with a situation, a lot of times people won't do anything and they'll back down or they won't even say anything. Jesus Christ took the matters in his own hands and he just said, get this stuff out of here. You know, this, this isn't right and I'm not going to stand for it. And we need to have a line in the sand. Like here's a line in the sand. He's saying, you start bringing this stuff into the temple? No, not on my watch. It ain't going to happen. I'm going to make a big deal out of this. I'm going to make a scene out of this and you're going to go. And there's going to be no question in anybody's mind where I stand about this. I guarantee you they didn't try doing this again while Jesus was around. And I know he wasn't around for that long, but still, like that's, they're like, okay, yeah, I think he's pretty serious about that. We need to have that zeal. And I'm not saying you have to flip over tables to have zeal, okay? But... We need to have a line in the sand when, when, when you're in situations where you're just going to be like, yeah, I'm not going to allow that. That's just, that's just not going to happen. It's not going to happen in my house. It's not going to happen in my, you know, whatever. That's, I'm not going to allow that to happen around my kids. You know, there's, there's, there's all kinds of wickedness where we know we live in a sinful world, but people start pushing things too far. and We need to be able to say, no, that's disgusting. Get that out of here. You know, there's, like, I'm not going to, going to, to have a get together or something, some sodomites are gonna come over and like start hold you know, just get get out of my house. And they're not gonna come over anyways. I mean, that's kind of a stupid example because I don't know why they would ever even come over to my house. But um, you know, whatever. There's 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 a lot of different things that could happen, and it's just like you need to have that zeal to 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 be able to stand up. Now, zeal can be infectious, and that's a good thing. Um, turn if you would to Galatians four, last place I'll have you turn. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 1 says, For as touching the ministering to the saints, it is superfluous for me to write to you. For I know the forwardness of your mind, for which I boast of you to them of Macedonia and Achaia, that, excuse me, that Achaia was ready a year ago, and your zeal hath provoked very many. So again, he's talking about the ministering to the saints, and he's saying like, it's superfluous for me to write to you, because it, 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 you know, like, I, I don't even really need to write to you about this. The ministering is because you're doing such a good job with it. He says, I boast of you to them of Macedonia. Talking about the Corinthians. He's saying, you know, I'm, I'm telling those of Macedonia about you guys, about how well you minister unto the saints and how you are just, you guys are on it. You're, you know, you're helping people out. You're doing good works. You're ministering to them. He says that Achaia was ready a year ago and your zeal hath provoked very many. So because you, you know, because this church was do, it had such a great zeal and they were, I mean, they were, they were really friendly. They were helping people out. They're ministering. It became infectious. Now other people are saying, oh, wow, you know. And sometimes that's all we need is a, is a good example. People who are on fire. You know, I, I love, you know, Pastor Romero, when, before he became a pastor and before I became a pastor, we were church members together. He had a great zeal. He has a great zeal of God. And he would oftentimes, you know, that, that zeal would, would be infectious towards me. And I, and I, and I loved him for it. You know, he's a great friend of mine. And, and when he would do good things, he'd come up with all these ideas like, hey, man, let's go out soul winning every day this week. Hey, let's do this. Hey, let's do that. 
That's a great zeal that he had. And you know what? That rubs off and that gets you to do even more. And then other people see the same thing. I'm like, hey, yeah, let's do that. Just like the, the, the small town soul winning thing. You know, it started off real small, but there's a lot of zeal behind that. Now it's like people are starting to do this all over the place. It's growing. It's becoming infectious. People are becoming, having a more zeal towards soul winning and, and ministering and serving God. We need to try to make sure that we have that zeal. And when you have that zeal, it grows and it'll impact other people. Um, Galatians chapter 4, verse 17. Last, last point I'm going to make on this. Galatians 4, 17, it says, They zealously affect you, but not well. Yea, they would exclude you that ye might affect them. So he's talking about people who are being zealous and affecting you, but, not, but you're, not, you're not being affected well. You know, in Romans 10, it says that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. So we need to, we need to make sure, obviously, it's not just all emotion and all just, just hype that we're doing the right thing. But when we're doing the right thing, we ought to be hyped up about it. We ought to be pumped up about it. Like, yeah, man, we're going so we're going to get some people saved today. Hey, that's great. Praise the Lord for that. It's a good way to be zealously affected. Verse 18, he says, but it is good to be zealously affected always in a good thing and not only when I am present with you. So I'm going to leave you with the last point is don't just be zealous in church. Like when you come to service, hey, and it's great, amen. If you hear a good sermon that really speaks to you, you're like, man, I want to do more. I want to, I want to serve God. I want to, I'm going to change some of my life. Amen, be zealous now. But not only when I'm with you. Go, you know, tomorrow, and, to, you know, and it's going to be more difficult then, but try to retain that zeal throughout the week and throughout your life and, and maintain that, that zealous attitude because that's why Jesus died for you. Why did Jesus give himself for us? He had, he had a great life. He had a perfect life, sinless life, but he gave himself for us. That he might redeem us from all iniquity, purify unto himself a peculiar people who are zealous of good works. Let us respect and honor the sacrifice that Christ made. Now, especially now that we're saved by purifying ourselves, becoming different from the world, detaching ourselves from the world, becoming a peculiar people, and being zealous towards doing good things. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for this great verse in the Bible. We thank you for the great gift that you've given to us, dear Lord. We thank you for giving yourself for us. Lord, help us uh, to, um, to show our appreciation and to show our love for you by making the changes in our life, dear God, by being zealous, by, by, not, not, by not being conformed to this world, but by being conformed to the image of your Son, dear Lord. You gave us so many examples from the Bible. God, help us not to just be forgetful hearers, but doers of the work, that, that every day we could go out and just have the right, proper mindset to do what's right in your sight, dear Lord, that we're not just this, we're not just this phony hypocrite of a Christian that, that could come into church on a Sunday morning and, and look nice and say the right things, but then the, whole, the, the, the rest of the week live wicked as hell, dear Lord. I pray that you please help us to just be strengthened, to, to make this a part of our life, that we can be a, a, a Christian that you wouldn't be ashamed of every day of our life, dear Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.